Okay, I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. We like to start on time. Um, I know it's a couple of minutes past three, but we give everybody a few more minutes to get logged in. So we're going to get started today and people will continue to join us. Uh, I want to let you know that we are live streaming this webinar on Facebook today. It will be recorded both on Facebook and on Zoom. It will be available on Facebook as soon as we end via recording. And then we will get it up on our website as well as on our YouTube site for individuals who'd like to view this after um, having it go live today. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that if you're viewing it live on Facebook, please use the chat box on Facebook to ask your questions. And if you are viewing it on Zoom, please use the chat box on Zoom to ask your questions. So with that, I will get started um, with introductions. Marnie, if you want to share your screen with your PowerPoint. So today we're um, going to be talking about natural practices for supporting special education at home. Um, we have collaborated with the Center for Community Services for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies um, through the University of Maine, and um, we're welcoming, welcoming Marty Morneau, Jennifer Mayverde, Jen Corbiel, Laurie Mack, and Tim Sear. Um, I'm going to give you some brief introductions in the, of each one. Marnie has been working for 25 years in the field of early childhood in elementary special education, in general education, in a public school constant. Con con consultation. She's a parent responder at CCIDS, so she does do work with parents specifically on inclusion models um, within a public school setting. She's early childhood consultant at Maine Roads to Quality Professional Development Network. She works under the New Hampshire and Maine LEND Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities Program, faculty member and a leadership mentor. And she's adjunct faculty university at Maine School of Learning and Teaching and the parent of a child with a disability herself. Tim, Timothy Sears, an occupational therapist. He received his bachelor's of science in occupational therapy at the University of New England in 1987. He has 33 years of experience in occupational therapy and recently moved to the central Maine region in August, 2019. Prior to that, he made his home in Aroostook County where he owned, uh, sorry, somebody's, pulling up the chat. Let me just close that real quick. Um, where he owned and operated his own private practice, um, a rustic occupational therapy for 18 years. While in private practice, Tim worked with Child Developmental Services, or CDS, supporting preschool aged children and their families. He also provided occupational therapy services to five school systems, along with servicing home health agencies and rehabilitation centers. Prior to beginning his present position at RSU 14, which is Wyndham and Raymond Schools, Tim worked in SAD 27 in Fort Kent for 10 years. Laurie Mack is a speech language pathologist with 25 plus years as a speech language pathologist serving mostly pediatrics, birth to five. She's the executive director of Northeast Hearing and Speech in Portland, Maine, faculty member of the UNE LEND Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Program, an active member of the Portland Connect Ed Starting Strong Committee and Westbrook Children's Project Community Initiatives to improve kindergarten readiness and third grade reading levels, and special interest in the evaluation and treatment of young children with speech language delay disorders and supporting parents, students, early childhood educators, specialists, and teachers in the facilitation of language and literacy with children ages birth to age five. Jen Corbiel is a physical therapist and the founder of Mainly Kids, an interdisciplinary outpatient clinic in Saco. Mainly Kids provides OT, PT, and speech services and currently is providing telehealth throughout the state for CDS, public schools, as well as for outpatient services. My daughter, Samantha, will be doing an appointment at four o'clock with Mainly Kids this afternoon. And Jennifer Mayverde is a licensed clinical professional counselor with 20 plus years working with kids and families early childhood mental health consultant at Maine Roads to Quality Professional Development Network and clinical mentor for LEND, the Leadership Education and Neural Development and Related Disabilities at the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies. So with those introductions, I believe I'm turning it over to Marty to start the presentation for you today. Uh, I will be manning the chat box, so um, feel free to ask questions. If we feel like it's better to hold the question to the end, um, I will do that. Um, if I feel like it needs to be answered immediately, I'll try to, to pause and get that question answered. 
it may be that it's covered later on the presentation as well. So bear with us on that. Um, mm -hmm. And with that, it's your show, Marnie. Okay, thank you. Let me get my slides up. Go. Let's see. Always something. As soon as I closed my notes, they went away. All right. Here we go. There they are. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, as Carrie shared, uh, my name is Marnie Morneau and I'm an inclusion facilitator who supports families and topics related to special education at CCIDS or the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies. Um, at CCIDS, we are committed to enhancing and promoting the interdependence, productivity, integration, and inclusion for all Maine citizens with disabilities and their families. And I put a link in this presentation if you want to go to our website and learn more about the work that we do uh, in the state of Maine. So our agenda for our time together today, there are five of us presenting today to talk about incorporating a variety of pieces of special education and the therapies that support special education, including mental health and self-care today. So this is how we'll spend our time together today. But first off, some of you joining us today responded to our survey request for information to support this webinar, and we just want to say thank you for that. Um, as a team, we incorporated your feedback as we built this time together. So although we will present individually, we will likely overlap topically, as we often do when we work with your children in schools and in, your, in therapy. Each of us will spend time individually incorporating components of special education and self-care into your day. We will also share some resources as we move through. And at the end, we will share a resource drive that we've created with a lot more resources for you to have access to when we're done. As we get started spending time together today, I wanna to first honor what may be the current reality for all of us as families. As the mom of three, I have two kids that I'm homeschooling at home right now and one who's returned home as a college student. So it's a little crowded. I'm doing this webinar in my daughter's bedroom today, I'm hiding out from them. So to frame that conversation, let's pause and talk a bit about how things may be the same in life and how they may be different right now as we consider how to build out strategies for supporting natural education practices in your homes and in your daily routines. So what is the same and what is different? As we think about that, and as I've been listening to families talk and reading about that nationally and across the state, a number of themes have come up about what is the same and what is different. So routines, sometimes are the same and sometimes are different right now. How therapy is delivered for our children, how we care for our children. Some kids are still going to child care and some kids are not. Some are home right now with us. How we take care of ourselves. Our support systems. Some of us are continuing to have supports coming into our homes and some are choosing not to. How we access our medical support might look different. And how we interact with our teachers might be different. Our teachers may be as creative as ever, or we, be, we may be seeing a new, more creative side to them. Oops. Our kids learning, may be having their best learning experience that they've ever had learning at home, or some are struggling in this new online learning format or having their therapies via telehealth. It varies for sure. Some of us are considering this time to be a real gift and some are considering it to be a challenge. One thing that has certainly changed is that we are doing some version of either working at home or being at home and navigating remote learning with our kids. 
Both nationally and across the state, we are hearing from parents, this is one of the most challenging things for parents, including those kids with disabilities. Another thing that I'm definitely hearing from parents is, quote, that kids are over this online learning at home. Another subject that's coming up for parents is, as they're supporting their kids' education at home is regression. Here's what we know about regression generally. We have worries about regression. We also know our kids regress. How is this the same and how is it different from all kids? It's the same in that all kids regress during this time of different learning. And it's different in that as parents of children with disabilities, our children may regress in a deeper way academically, socially, and behaviorally due to these disruptions. And there's a link here for the Devereaux organization that can give you more information about that in supporting regression. So sometimes when I'm worried about these things, about how things are the same or how they're different in regression, mm -hmm. I like to read things like this from a principal from the Midwest. At some point in the future, public life will resume with a new normal and what we're all worried about that our children will be left behind. Try to remember that every child will likely be behind. So instead of going backwards, help your kids move forward with a new sense of what it means to be someone who loves learning. And that's a big part of what we're coming together for today, for us to support that love of learning even during this time. So Carrie's gonna help me with this poll. Um, I would like to know what does quarantine learning look like at your house currently? Now that we've talked about what's the same and what's different, let's talk about it together. So is it that mornings are easier than they were before your child? who used to struggle with getting up in the morning is excitedly greeting each day. They're able to learn in a less worrisome and pressured environment and you feel like your family is in the most relaxed learning time ever. Maybe that describes your home right now. Or does your child miss school? They did better with the structure and routine of school. They miss riding the bus and seeing their teachers. They need their teachers to support their IEP and 504 accommodations. Zoom school is not supporting all their learning modalities. This way of learning is stressful for my family. Or you can have a C, which is some mixture of both. So if you take a moment and in the chat box, choose either A, B, or C, which is a mixture of both. And then Carrie's gonna let us know where we landed. Okay, so if my count's correct, we currently have, wait, we're getting another one come in, hold on. <laughs> so we have five Bs, we only have three As and eight Cs right now. Mm, so it yeah. says I've, I have both that I'm seeing from my home to theirs. Some are glad to see me and have one-on-one -on -one time. I'm guessing that's a teacher who's, who's logging in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot of C's. It but, sounds like yeah, the combination of both w wins out, mm -hmm. which I, I have to say, if, if I'm talking about my house, it's the same. Some days are good, some days yeah. are bad. <laughs> some days are good and some days are bad. And I would say at my house, A was true in the beginning and now yeah. it's B. It flip-flops for sure. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely moving around. So thanks everybody. Yeah, it's, and uh, one of the parents said, um, I'm working from home, which has made it extremely difficult um, mm -hmm. and tremendously harder, which is what we're hearing from parents, especially after returning back from April break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those even though, districts. Yeah. 
Even though April break was not traditional and it's not like we could do a lot of fun things, it was still a break and we took away that structure. So returning to it was definitely a challenge after that. I wondered if this poll would be different if we launched it for parents as well. <laughs> what they, might we have voted for as parents? <laughs> we'll have to do that sometime in the future, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. What does quarantine working look like at your house? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I told somebody that I needed to have my kitchen chair surgically removed from my bottom the other day because <laughs> this is where I'm spending my time. <laughs> So that's know. how it looks like. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. yeah. Okay. And teenagers, my teenager has given up on trying to do anything online. Uh, we'll be trying again in the fall. Um, yeah, I think we have to keep in mind as hard as, as it is for the smaller kiddos, I think our middle school and transition age kids, mm -hmm. teenagers um, are having, mm -hmm. it's harder for them to socially bounce back. They're really, really missing that interaction that they get at school. My son, who's mm -hmm. 15, said to me, I never thought I'd say I miss school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so um, there, we're hearing a lot of, um, we can't get them to do anything at this point, Car uh, mm -hmm. Carrie Anderson says, and then another mm -hmm. elementary teacher um, says, our elementary sped kids aren't showing up at all. So, and this is where um, a lot of what you're, yeah, after April vacation is hard anyways, I would agree with that. Yep. Um, and so slide. this is where... A lot of what you're going to hear um, from here on will hopefully introduce some naturalistic practices that families that's are doing right. on an everyday basis, not yeah. to pile on to families, but to do instead. I think that's really important. Right. Marnie and I talked that we wanted to make sure that this webinar was not to pile on, but to no. prov provide you with some substitutes. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. will. Carrie will stop. That's okay. No, it's perfect. So what we'll talk about at, and Carrie, what a natural segue. Okay. Oops, now because you talked there. So there we go, Carrie. What a segue -er you are. I love that. Um, yeah, exactly, Carrie. It's not, um, not instead, it's in partnership um, and in, in tandem. So what are ways to add education into this time of education at home? So as part of the survey that people responded to, what we heard is that you would like to have ideas to create or recreate routine because some folks started with a routine when, when we first were at home and that's not working for you. So how do you do that? Really considering a balance with your life as families at home because some of you are feeling unbalanced at this point. Um, once that routine, routine is established, how do you integrate the goals that you're trying to work on that either the school's established or you've established as a family that are important into those routines? So how to make that a little bit more simple. How do you add activities to support those goals from daily life that's already happening? And then how do you connect with your child's team either for support or to have conversation about how can we do this all together because this is getting to be too much like you're all saying. And then lastly, how do you keep track of your child's successes and challenges so that you can be a reporter to your child's team whenever you're all back together in a physical space? Um, so that's what we'll spend our time together doing um, going forward. So first, let's talk about creating or recreating routine. Um, so a few things about that. First, I'd really just like to establish what do routines do for us, for all of us. So we tend to think about it for kids, um, including kids with disabilities, but it's also for us as family members, helps us to know the who, the when, the what order, and how often for our flow of our day. Um, but they also, you know, make kids feel safe and secure. They can also help us support development of new skills or reinforce skills that kids already have. You can see that it says good routines happen regularly or predictable are discussed and known to the whole family. And that means um, that if we're not available, say we're working or on a webinar, that somebody else in the family can pick that routine up and support either a child or another family member to know what to do. But they should also be flexible enough to change with the circumstances. So they should not be so rigid that they're a burden to the family structure. Um, and there's a link there again for more information about that to be helpful. Um, one thing that I like to say is that there's no rule about how many or what kind of routines you should have. What works well for one family might not work well for another. So I often have people call me and say, can you send me you know, an example routine? And what we end up doing is talking through what works for your family. So that's really important. Um, as we have all moved through this time, some of what has sustained us has been nesting the changes we have made 
to, had to make within the things that are established and familiar. So our routine that we're creating or recreating should include regular meal times, outdoor time, play time, fun time, and many, many other things that are unique to our family, which are not listed here, but you would include as you create that routine. So next, once that routine's created, you wanna integrate goals into that established routine. So now that you've done that, you, how do we go about adding those goals? First, you review your child's IEP or IFSP if they're littles for ideas about what you'd like to support at home. That does not mean every single goal that is on that document. You're gonna be looking for what you'd like to support or what you'd like to focus on. Um, if you don't have access to it, you can ask your child's teacher or case manager to provide you with a list of just the goals so you don't have to go through the whole document. At this point, most people have done that, but if you haven't, it's okay to ask. Um, list each of the IEP goals or goals you want to work on in a notebook. That's very simple or a template. We're going to look at some templates later together, whatever is simplest for you. Think about family routines and activities at home and how they might fit under each of your child's goals. Some activities you might want to consider are building your individual child's independence and social skills. Those are always really good to support at home. Some ideas could include personal hygiene. Those are things that we can work on at home. They can be challenging sometimes depending on age groups, but they're good to work on. Household chores, things that are family fun activities, um, but generally it can be fun to do things that are focused on kids' interests and hobbies. Anytime kids are engaged or excited are things that they're going to want to participate in. Each day of the week, check off the tasks or activities your child has done. You can also note successes or challenges that your child experienced, and if you added any supports to that. This should not be um, laborious or cumbersome. It just should be something that you've established for tracking. And again, we'll look at some samples of those later for you all. Then once you've got that down, we're going to add some activities to support those goals. So some things to consider when you're adding activities. First, um, include activities you can do together as part of your daily routine. So we're not trying to add to your daily routines. It's clear that everybody has plenty to do right now. So preparing snacks, exercising, watering plants, putting away groceries, um, that feels laborious right now, for sure, going to the grocery store and putting things away. Um, it's fine for your child's school activities to work around your schedule. So it could happen any time of the day, including the weekend. Be flexible with your expectations. Work with your child to create a place with the least amount of distractions for academic activities. I find that this is one that's particularly important. So whenever I'm working with my daughter and if she and I are working at the same table back to back with computers and I'm on a webinar, she has a harder time paying attention. So if your child is old enough to be part of the conversation or developmentally ready, let them help be part of the decision maker about where that's going to be in your house. And as you're considering integrating activities into the daily routines, consider how you can integrate other disciplines such as speech, OT, and PT into some of these activities. And you can ask those therapists, such as our friends who are gonna be on later, how can I cross over into those when I'm doing activities? Can I do more than one thing at once? Can I be working on OT and PT at the same time? It's okay to ask those questions. Also consider being realistic with the activities that we select. If they're too complex or difficult, our kids might get frustrated um, and give up or not want to do it, and, and that's never helpful. Um, try to maintain a consistent schedule so our kids know what to expect. Um, if it works, as we said earlier, on the weekends, it's fine to do it on the weekends or in the evenings. We were, a lot of us are trying to work during the day, so it's okay to do that when it works for us. There are many ways to do the same things. So um, your child might be the one to help you find a way to do something. So if we have a, an idea about a way to do something and our child is not wanting to participate, it can help to say, how do you think we should do this? Involve your kiddo in part of the decision making. 
And it's all right for your child to repeat skills already learned. So if you're seeing that your kiddo is struggling, it's okay to look into their IEP and work on some things that they've already worked on. It can help maintain their skills or refresh their skills. It's fine to do that. Um, and remember, for any new activities, you may need to break them down into smaller parts and provide some help and guidance as they're getting started. So some ideas for where to look for activities. Um, on this slide, there are sampling of activities. Um, the links include a variety of general education, special education, play-based activities, around the world tours, um, book readings, music concerts, ideas to create stories other than writing. So um, having your kiddos record a story orally into a video, um, trying to spark lots of different ways to interest children uh, in learning that is not sort of just that back and forth on the computer. So I'm not gonna take time to click through these, but they're here for you in here. And then there's a um, quite a bit more in that resource drive that we have for you as well. Let's see. So when you're struggling, um, if you feel like some of the things that you're doing with school are working really well, but some of them you'd like to find some different activities to engage your child better, there's a couple of websites here um, that can help support what you have from the school. Um, so this I would like to do, let me just see if it'll let me out of there. Perfect. Let's see. Can you see that okay, Carrie? Okay, perfect. All right, so this one, sometimes it doesn't pop up okay. Um, Wide Open School is a really great website. Um, you can see here that it has activities for pre-K, K to two, and three to five. And its structure is, it shows it as a daily schedule um, and you can move through. Get this out of my way here. Morning midday, afternoon, and you can just click on some added ideas for kids. So if you feel like you have plenty of math for the morning, but you want an idea to get your kids moving, um, you, you can click on that for them. Midday, it just gives you some ideas like adding Legos, materials. So if you need some things to supplement what your kids have, and then it even gives you, and it has what I really like in particular, it has a couple of things that are offline, which I think we're all looking for some of those. And then if you scroll down to the bottom and you click, um, let's see, just spot on here, I think it's under an educator. My planner. Yeah. On this My Daily Planner, on the bottom, there's some great prompting questions um, for kiddos who maybe don't like to write their responses. You could prompt them with these questions or record their responses. So there's lots of options on this website that I really like for kiddos. And then I'll go back because we have another website. Marnie, are both these websites free resources? They are. Everything that I'm showing you is a free resource. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we wouldn't do anything that isn't free. This one is through Khan, Khan Academy. Um, and this one is a little bit more structured, but again, it would be a great supplement. So if you feel like you have some good activities, but you're stuck on something for math or for reading, you could click through here. And it has grades all the way through eighth grade. And then some supplemental things for, um, silent reading, things like that. So if you need just some supplemental activities, this is also a great website. All right, let's go back, there we go. Okay. And then connecting with your child's team as needed. So if you're feeling uncertain on how to do all of these things, choosing activities, what goals, how to do all this, or if you just wanna partner with your child's teachers, you feel like you know what you'd like to add, but you're not sure you'd like to partner with them to make sure this feels okay and you're still meeting your kiddos' goals, there, here are some thoughts about how to connect with their school-based team. So it's an important to establish the when, how, and who, so both you and your team can be successful. 
So when you were talking about the when, it's really about what will be the pattern. Will you do that as needed? Will it be consistent? Will it be the same time frame as when you were in the school or does it need to change? That helps everybody to be successful to know the when. And then the how over email, Zoom, phone, text, our how is expanding every day. And the who, how will you decide who to outreach to? That looks a little bit different right now, I'm finding for a lot of parents. Will it be by their role, um, teacher, therapist, um, or will it be by things such as individual goal? Uh, one person is particularly good with math and that child made a connection, so will you outreach that way? Or will it be by relationship? The child felt really safe with this particular person. So that's important to establish with the team how you're going to do that. And then once you connect with the team, you can talk together about how to blend your homeschool needs in a way that supports both you, your child, and your family. And that's really the key here is how to do that together. And some things that, that are good about connecting with the team, it can support you with being re realistic about adding activities. Sometimes I find as a parent, I might say, oh, we can do all of these things. And my team will say, that seems like a lot. Let's cut this back so that you can work together on that. Um, what supported your child to be best in, engaged in school might also work at home so they can give you some really great ideas if you connect with them. And then just to close up this part, um, I really liked this when I found it. Uh, just thinking about um, just opportunities, this time at home, using this whole quarantine time at home as an opportunity to help kids get more excited about learning, using activities at home and leaning into the love for learning. So instead of maybe being quite so structured just for the next month asking kids, what do you want to learn? What would you like me to listen to that I don't always have time for? Um, what do you want to do yourself that I've been doing for you? And making that part of kids' days um, as opposed to so much structured time. And then on this slide, here are some resources to support you when you're working with your kids. Um, many kids need social stories and visual supports to support them um, to do some of these activities at home. So we have some of those here. Also some video, video modeling apps, apps with self-control and regulation, and note-taking apps. Again, we have more of those uh, in the drive as well. So next up, we have Tim Sear, and he will be talking um, with you all about occupational therapy. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to hear or see everyone. So I'm going to share my um, occupational therapy perspective on some natural ways or natural practices to perhaps help your child at home. I'm going to share my slideshow here. Here we go. So one thing that we really want to help you realize and, and remember is um, home is a very valuable environment to address visual, motor, and sensory skills of children and adults with special needs. There are several daily responsibilities that require visual and um, motor as well as the sensory skills. Also want to touch upon routine. Marnie mentioned it. Um, really, it's what works for the family. Um, but the important thing about a routine it's, it's, is the key to helping a student manage the home-based expectations better. Remember that going to school is a routine to which these students have adapted. With distance learning in place, we have to help the student understand and manage a similar routine at home. Hold on, hold on, Tim. Did you share Tim. your screen? Yes, I'm not seeing your slides. Oh, hang on. Um, I did. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Let's try that. Ooh. Did we lose 10? Oh, oh, wait, there he is, okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll try that again. I apologize, everyone. So we're gonna hit share screen. 
and share. There it goes. All righty. We got you now. All right. So should I continue where I was at? Uh, can you maybe show them the first two slides? I don't Certainly. know. If... So I had this one here. Okay. Yep. And then this one here. I'll, I'll read this one over again. So a routine, as I said, is a key to helping students manage the home-based, um, uh, let me see here, there, expectations better. Um, and remember, going to school, this was a routine that the students had adapted to. So now they're, they're, they're managing distance learning. Um, we have to help the student understand and manage a similar routine at home. Having a routine for these students reduces anxiety of the unknown. Routine increases participation and facilitates the student's desire to be part of learning. So making it consistent. And this is something that I see um, always just working with students with special needs um, in my sessions, um, especially when I'm new to them and they're new to OT. I might start with three activities that are the same for three weeks in a row, only to create a, a routine and to help the child understand what my expectations are. And, and typically when I do that, the child, I will see less behaviors and they'll be much more engaged. Um, okay. So I'm going to go through the different age, age ranges. I'm going to start first by discussing the toddler and the preschool age. So this, this area, we're going to be looking at early motor skills, the strength, overall strength of the body, uh, the control of the body and stability. How can they manage their arms, their head, their neck, their eyes, and their hands? Um, so with early motor skills, we want to have the child explore and play on their belly, in a sitting position, and when appropriate, maybe in a standing position. Make sure that the child is provided with physical support that is necessary in each posture to assure that the trunk, that middle part of the body, and the head alignment are all at midline, right in the middle. Um, we want the eyes and the mouth and the hands all ready to explore and learn. Then we have hand function. This is grasp, how the fingers work and the thumb work, works together. Um, coordination of the hands and also awareness of the hands. Exploring toys, bath time fun, dressing, feeding and social times, all of these provide opportunity, opportunities for young child to reach out for objects, to hold objects with one hand or two, and even switch objects from one hand to another. It allows them to feel the texture of items. These experiences play a role in the child's hand development. And hand development includes fine motor coordination, so how are those small muscles of the hands working, hand strength, can they sustain a grasp um, for different items, uh, refined pinch, for, pinch formation, so we have the tip to tip or the three jaw chuck, or lateral, so those are all different ways that we use our fingers. Uh, finger isolation when we need to, as well as understanding tactile, the, the, how the skin uh, makes sense of how things feel. And then proprioception, which is how the joints and muscle, muscles tell us how things feel. So are they light, are they heavy, um, are they squishy? And all, so all of this is happening um, through these experiences. Then we have play. This is the time for exploring and enjoying and evolving. At this age level, the child's play is where they get to explore and learn. Playing with siblings or with their parents provide the toddler with many opportunities for fun, but also opportunities for others to model appropriate and age-related play skills. So we want independent exploration, of course, but sometimes some of our children need a little bit of support. They need to see how a, to a toy is, is used um, to, to, for the modeling um, and the repetition. So as I say, at this age level, we're really looking at work and play that can naturally happen simultaneously. Oops, sorry. Here we have some little ones exploring the world around them. Toys, outdoors, some are sitting, some are on their bellies. The elementary level, this is where we're going to see further development of fine motor and visual motor skills. So at the 
the young age, they were, there was an introduction to how their hands work and how their eyes and hands work together and how their head stayed in a line in midline. Now we're going to be asking those skills to, to develop higher, um, learning higher levels of skills and practicing these higher level of skills. Um, we want to provide training and practice with fine motor and visual motor skills. And the visual motor skills, just to make sure you understand, that's the fine motor and the eye-hand coordination skills that are used for writing tools and scissor skills and similar things like that, um, that are not familiar to the child. Initially, the child will require more support and guidance at this level. This is when we introduce writing or coloring tools, the use of scissors, tying shoes, and managing fasteners such as buttons, snaps, and zippers. Because new skills are being developed and are practiced, it may require a consistent schedule to provide a variety of learning and play experiences to develop those skills. At the early elementary level, like grades uh, K, one, and two, your child may do best with short sessions that last about 15 minutes. They will do their best management of these visual and motor skills if challenges are worked for a short time rather than many repetitions in one sitting. The repetition of the skills or for the skills will come with additional, additional practice sessions. Then at this level, we're applying motor skills to learning expectations and play. There's creativity, there's learning, and there's practicing. So in addition to having your child work on skills during structured sessions, you can also have them practice fasteners when they are getting dressed for the day or dressing to go outside. You can also have them help, with, help you with cooking or snack making activities that might allow them to explore the use of cookie cutters or a safe butter knife, um, tongs, or maybe mixing with spoons. They can also learn how to use a washcloth during a bath time. So a lot of times, you know, some our, our children at this age, we may kind of do things automatically for them, but these are instances where naturally they can do some learning. Excuse me. Um, so elementary level continued, here we're gonna have an introduction to life skills. So we might introduce some chores and helping at home Having children to be part of chores and duties around your home is a fair expectation at this age level. Some children may need to work in a sitting position, having them sort utensils and uh, place them into a divided utensil um, could be a productive task. Another option would be having a child remove the dry laundry out of the dryer and place it into a laundry basket. This can develop arm strength, eye-hand coordination, and bilateral coordination which is using the two sides of the body together. The child may not be able to complete all of the components of some chores, but if you are able to identify a component that works for them, then you are naturally providing your child with fine motor and visual motor practice. So they'll also be learning skills and practicing skills to be the helper and the explorer. Um, as mentioned earlier, this is an age range that requires uh, teaching of new skills. Remember that helping around the house, playing with toys, playing with family, or playing outside all provide opportunities to practice in a natural manner. So we have here we have children practicing their scissor skills. Um, one thing that I've seen work well with families is if um, parent, if families do lists, they might have their child cut paper into strips, um, scrap paper or whatever, so they're ready for use as um, to make the lists. Oops. So at the middle school level, we're going to have more consistent exposure to life skills and increase the responsibilities as home. Increase consistency with responsibilities as home within the, the, the um, scope of skills for the child. Um, at this functional level, you may want to be more consistent in expecting the child to be part of the household chores. The use of life skills activities naturally creates expectations for hand function, eye-hand coordination, and planning and organizing. It is important to determine what the child manages best. 
Select the activities that interest the child. Perhaps select a task that the child is responsible for in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening. Supervise as necessary, but slowly allow independence so they continue to develop their attention span and organizational skills. If the child needs assistance with motor coordination, provide hand over hand guidance or modeling, but try to reduce this guidance as they make progress. Because you are relying on tasks that have to be completed in your home, you will provide a natural way for the child to practice their fine motor skills, bilateral coordination, and eye hand coordination. You are also helping the child to develop independence. Many times, being independent is a strong mater, motivator on its own. And we have functional application of fine motor and visual motor skills. This is where we look at pre-vocational skills, more consistent use of school tools such as staplers, rulers, envelopes, um, and, and a tape dispenser for some examples. Um, so you can have your child be involved with the use of a stapler to gather and organize their own work. Or, if, you're, if they're folding a letter to a friend or to family member, they could work on stuffing envelopes, applying a postal stamp in the correct place, and applying mail, mailing labels when you are completing mailings or paying your bills. When you introduce new activities, the child may resist at first. We see that sometimes at this age level. Uh, begin by having them observe you doing the work and then invite them to help. Sometimes, you know, seeing and having them the models is, makes it feel a little safer. It is okay if the child only completes three, three to five components or separate tasks at first. Given additional exposure to these home tasks, they will begin to feel more confident in being part of them. This is also a good time for, in, for the introduction to community services. Um, it's a good time to have the child explore the community services that your family may commonly rely on. For example, getting an oil change, ordering takeout from a restaurant, and getting home repairs addressed. They could help you look up these services online and have them get you the phone number. It will naturally expose them, expose them to resources that are available and help them begin to understand a variety of roles in your community it's a good time to begin developing this awareness. Of course, we've got the gardening helping out in the yard. A lot of um, good hand function, eye-hand coordination, bilateral coordination, and they're getting some work done. There's some meal prep, and sometimes some um, field trips to the community. High school and adults. At this level, we want to look at applying self-care, community access, leisure, use of school tools, and vocational skills within a daily routine. So it's, they're not, we're probably seeing them not necessarily learning, but it's a, applying. As the child um, becomes, or the learner becomes older and is demonstrating a fairly consistent foundation in fine motor skills and visual motor skills, you will want to provide the child the opportunity to rely on these skills on a daily basis. Older students or learners should be managing all or portions of their self-care skills. This can include bathing, grooming, and dressing. Again, they might do it all, they might do components. They should be able to be part of managing simple meal preparation as long as they can manage the tools required in a safe manner. Remember, the students does not have to complete an entire task for it to count as a skill. If the child is managing components of life skill activities and becoming actively involved within their ability level, then they are naturally using skills that are beneficial to them. Have them involved in list making for, for the home, as in grocery lists or to-do lists. And this can be in written form or they could work on typing skills. They could type them out. Posting birthdays, anniversaries, or appointments on a calendar are also um, great ways of practicing handwriting while also developing awareness of the world around them. So here we have some self-care, maybe pet care, the routines that go around that, and perhaps helping clean the car. They could be assigned the whole job or part of the job. 
I also want to touch a little bit on um, sensory modulation. Um, that does set the stage for our learners to be attentive. So it, can, it involves the eyes, our skin, tactile, uh, our auditory listening system, and our muscles and joints. So this is a person's ability to be aware of, to understand, and make use of sensory information found in their environments. These abilities help them to be at the just right state for play, for learning, and for self-care. While helping our students at home, we need to make sure that they are alert, that they're calm, and they're ready to participate in learning. Always pay attention to the space in which your child is playing or learning. Is the lighting okay? Too much light? Too little? How about the noise level? Are there too many other noises around them? Might they have a hard time to focus? Do they have busy siblings around that could cause a distraction? Also, pay attention to the child's mood. Sometimes, if they are struggling with sensory modulation, they may come across as overactive, under alert, um, frustrated, or exhibit mood strings, swings. Excuse me. If you are familiar with the sensory information, such as touch, sight, or sound that works best for them, make sure that the environment has what they need to help them be at their best learning potential. All right, thank you. So Tim, we had a couple questions and I figure what I can do is ask you this question as you wrapped up your session. Um, and we can address that now before moving on. Um, one was at what point does the OT look at its system of tech devices that the child or student could use? Um, so, you know, is there a specific age or is there a specific uh, milestone or task that a child might be struggling with that you would look at to assistive technology to address? I, I think that assistive technology can be um, um, made available at really at any age. Um, I think it's important to work closely with your occupational therapist to determine that. Um, you know, import some things to consider is, you know, how is the child's posture? Are they able to sit up or at least maintain, you know, uh, some sort of control for their head and neck and so that their, you know, their hands could function um, to, to access the, 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 the devices or the tools. So there's a lot of options there. Great. And then the other, we had a suggestion, but then a question embedded in the suggestion as well. Um, her, they're learning buttons. She made up the um, phrase peak, pinch, and pull fabric away um, to help the child. Um, she was also wondering how you first approach tying shoes, 15 minute sessions, and do you use or have task analysis for this? Um, I, I, have, I, I have worked with a task analysis that breaks step by step. Um, and definitely short sessions. Um, a lot of times I will just work on the very first, the crisscross. If that goes well, then I, I pr progress to the knot and then just kind of build it up from there. Great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Um, and Tim, sticking around. So if any other questions come up during um, the presentation, we'll have the opportunity at the end as well. And we will pass it on to Laurie um, to talk about hearing and speech. Laurie, you're muted. <laughs> Still muted. Can you hear me now? Okay. Hi, everyone. So this is a time when occupational therapists and speech pathologists work together. And before I would start a session, I would try to figure out that regulation piece, Tim. So for those of you who have been sitting for an hour, you might want to stand up or raise your hands or stretch a little bit before we dive into the next thing. Um, I can't see you, so feel free to do that while you're listening. Oh, thank you, Marnie. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about speech language pathology today. And there we go. And I thought I'd start with just talking about some of the common areas of focus in the IEP or IFSP. And there's a reason I'm doing this. I'm not trying to uh, oversell you on the contents of the IEP and how much you need to dig into them. But I do want to highlight 
the fact that we might overlook, overlook one of the most important parts when we're talking about how we can address language at home. So just briefly, receptive language skills will be listed as how your child's understanding what's happening around the world. Expressive language is how they're using language. So whether they're talking or using signs or using symbols or pictures, how are they communicating what they want to tell you? How are they uh, letting you know what they like and what they don't like? Social language is a piece I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's about how and why we communicate, uh, like making and maintain, uh, maintaining eye contact, taking turns in conversation, asking for help and such. And then sound production is a piece that comes up qu quite commonly as well, and that's how children are producing sounds. The reason I wanted to talk about these is because we often hear from parents, the first thing we hear when there's a concern about speech and language is they're worried that their child isn't talking. And of course, that is one of the things that we all want to be able to do. But one of the things we overlook is the importance of the receptive language piece. So receptive language skills, how your child's understanding the world is something that you can be addressing all day long. It's kind of like when you go to build a house, um, you really need to build the foundation first. You don't just go in and start thinking about decorating as I probably would, like what color are the walls gonna be and what shape is the room gonna be. You have to build the foundation first. So when you're talking about things that you're doing in your day every single day, you're actually working on building the receptive language skills and the foundation upon which your child will develop the expressive skills, the social skills, and some of the other pieces. I will say it again, you'll probably hear me say it a few times, it's one of my soapbox issues. We have to remember that we want to input language, we want to talk about things and help our child to understand the world before we try to export or pull information from them. I find sometimes in the preschools and early elementary schools that I go into that a lot of times people are concentrating on trying to pull out what the child knows and they're not paying attention to as much about what you're putting in. And it's important because that's where your opportunities are when we talk about facilitating language in naturalistic settings. So let's start with just the basics. What do you and your family need to do today? And how can you include your child and facilitate language while you do these things? So you don't need to always find a new craft or a new Pinterest idea or something else that's come across your plate that needs to be new and different. It can just be incorporating speech and language into the stuff that you're already doing. And we'll talk about how you do that in just a second. One of the other basic things that I want to share with people is that you can use what you have. You don't need to go and buy the fanciest toys. You don't need to go and download the best apps for ABCs and one, two, threes. You can use things that are right in your home, your boxes and measuring cups and cupboards and blankets and towels and things that you have inside your home are okay to use to address speech and language skills. It's not about having the best, most fantastic, most recent toy. And then another kind of thing to highlight is to meet the children where they're at. So for your preschool children, your toddlers, um, some of your, even your young elementary children, you might be playing on the floor and it's not as easy as you age to get down on the floor, but it's really important to kind of maintain a distance where they can see your face so they can see the models that you're providing. And if it's an older child, where are you most comfortable? On the couch, on the, at the table, at the bar? Get kind of near their level um, and be present where they can be seeing you. And use their interests. So, as you know, if you're not someone who likes to draw, you, the last thing you want to hear someone say to you is, please draw me a picture of a bird or a cow or a dog or whatever. You're not going to want to do that. I'm trying to figure out what your child is most interested in and then meet them where they're at. <clears throat> and then you can expand on things from there. One of the other important things is to figure out what they're doing. And we forget often to just observe what the child is doing. So, Sometimes we're thinking, oh, he's only using one word or two words and I want him to be using sentences and why isn't he doing that? Let's just start with where are they and then you can add one more piece or one element and start to expand on their language. And then lastly on this kind of bullet list is to make sure that you share the things that you like with your child, things that you feel passionate about because the more excited you are in the kitchen if you're cooking, 
or in the garden, if you're gardening, or if you're walking, whatever you really like to talk about, your child will see that passion in you, and you, that will be your opportunity to, to engage them in some language learning activities. These are some of the strategies that we're just gonna talk about uh, today. We're gonna talk about modeling, expanding, paying attention to questions, which is another one of my soapbox issues you'll hear about in a minute, and then how do you kick it up a notch and make some connections. So first, modeling. People uh, forget how important it is to just be talking about what you do while you're doing it. Um, it's a way for you to input that receptive language. It's a way for your child to hear about new and different vocabulary over and over again. It's like a Rolodex in some ways, for those of you who are old enough to understand what a Rolodex is. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, a, back in the day, you used to write down people's phone numbers in this little tiny file system. Oh my gosh, I think I have one in this room somewhere. Um, and then you kept looking up the number whenever you needed it. But over time, it got to the point where you didn't need to look up the number. It's the same way with building your child's vocabulary. They need to hear it over and over and over again. And then they start learning it. And then eventually, they don't need to think, oh, what's the word for that? It just comes out more naturally. So you'll be able to model language all day long. I feel like I have the easiest job here today because just talking is part of what you can be doing. And we take for granted how, how easy that can be because we've all kind of got engaged in Zoom conferences and internet. And we could just be modeling and facilitating language by talking about what you eat, when you drive, where you go, how you get dressed, up and down the stairs, whatever your child is doing at the moment. Some people say, okay, well, how do you do that? One way to model language is to talk about what you're doing as you're doing it. It's called self-talk, and you don't need to understand, or you don't need to remember the name of this particular strategy. Um, it's more that it's something that you can do whenever you're not sure what else to do, and I'll explain that in a second. It's kind of like something you would see on a cooking show, like Rachel Ray. If you ever, listen to one of those cooking shows, you'll hear them using self-talk. I'm cutting up the onions, I'm chopping up the carrots, I'm gonna, well, she throws salt over her shoulder, right? I'm throwing some salt over my shoulder for luck. Uh, I'm going to saute this in the pan. She's kind of talking about everything she does as she does it. This is something that I do in some of my trainings in our clinic and in preschools around, and everyone says, yeah, yeah, I can do that, I can do that. But then when you go and do it, it seems kind of weird because you're talking to yourself. But think about it in another way. I like to use the example of driving in Boston. Uh, it's not something I enjoy doing. I'm fine until we get to Storo Drive. I can talk, I can listen, the radio can be on, the windows can be down slightly. Everybody can be having a conversation, joking and having a great time. But the minute I get closer to the city, I need the radio to go off, I need people to be quiet, I need the windows to go up, I need to concentrate. So I'm, but I'm talking my way through it all the time. Okay, everybody turn everything down and I need to go to Storrow Drive now. I need to take this exit. What number am I gonna take? And you start talking to yourself as you do it. Think about that for your child. I'm washing the dishes in the sink. I'm cutting up the vegetables. I'm playing with the dog. It's much simpler than it seems, but it is really hard to do because you think you're kind of silly talking to yourself. But what you're doing is you're providing that language modeling for your child. And on the other side of the coin is another strategy called parallel talk where you're talking about what your child is doing. So this is more like a sportscaster. Going down, uh, you, when you listen to a basketball game, he's running down the court, oh, he hit that three-pointer, he fouled that guy over there, he's staying close to the baseline, whatever it is. The sportscaster kind of describes what the, what the uh, sports the athlete is doing you're going to do that same kind of thing with your children or your young children in particular when they are doing things so a child who's not very verbal might be tapping on the counter and you just think it's cute which it is but if you're going tap 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 and i tap too you're giving them a new word you're exploring that a little bit with them if they're driving a car across the table and you just go drive 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 you are providing them with a model for language by talking about what they're doing at a time where they don't already have those words. They haven't yet built their Rolodex per se. 
Another way to kind of facilitate their language is expanding it. And remember back in one of the first few slides, I said you need to first observe what your child is doing. So if you have a little one who's just using one word, saying mommy or, or car or go, you, you add one more element to that and add it to them. So add it for them. So if they say ball, you say big ball. If they say my ball, you can say my ball goes downhill. Or if they say daddy, you can say daddy goes. You, you're just adding one more piece. If your child is using sentences, and they're not yet combining them, maybe they've started with a sentence about what they're doing. I'm taking the dog out. You could say you're taking the dog outside and now you're gonna go for a walk or some other piece that you're just expanding what it is they're saying. If your child is using one picture to communicate, you can help them add one more element, one more picture so they can combine those pictures to communicate a message. If your child is using a device, it's a similar process where you start with just one and then you add one more element, just one more. And the theory behind that is trying to make sure that you're not modeling such big language that they have, it's just way above their head. So for example, if you are using six word sentences and the child is only using two word sentences, for some pieces of the day, you might slow it down. And I use the example of, um, of working with students at, at uh, UNE. So if they've never been with a toddler, they go into these toddler groups and they're very excited and they start playing with the farm and they say, I'm taking the farm and I'm putting on the roof and now we're gonna go find the cow. And I've got little ones who don't know how to use all that language yet. So I pop down on the ground and just say, farmer up, 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 up. And the child starts saying, ah, ah, up. And they get closer and closer to um, what we're trying to say. They can't, they can't comprehend and imitate those big long sentences but they can imitate up. So you're just staying just a little bit ahead of the child. And then one of the really big questions, which I think may be new for some of you, is paying attention to how you're asking questions. So for little children or young children or people who are just learning how to talk, one of the things that we need to pay attention to is how many questions are we asking and why are we asking the questions? It's normal for us as adults to ask questions back and forth. What did you do this weekend? Where did you go? Did you try out that new restaurant? Or actually in this time, what did you do at home this week? <laughs> what did you get to see on Netflix? Um, but that's how we interact with adults. But with children who are just learning language, it's more important to model for them. So if you're always saying, what did you do today? Who's your favorite teacher? Where did you go? That's harder for them to generate language. Another way to approach that would be to comment about something that you've done or comment about something that you think might have happened at school today. So instead of bombarding them with questions, you're commenting maybe three times before you ask a question. So what I mean by that, or an example of that, is uh, often seen when our kids come home from school, right? We say, how was your day today? And the kids say, fine. And you say, what did you do? And they say, nothing. If you, um, in your conversation with them, start with something different besides what did you do? Where did you go? How was it? And you just talk about what you did. So you know what I did today? Or you know what I had for lunch today? Or I saw the funniest thing? Sometimes they're more likely to engage in conversation with you. If your intent is to find out what they know, then you ask the question. But if your intent is to engage them in conversation, think about another way you can do that. It is really important to ask questions in an open-ended way as your child matures and has more language. So you can pose questions like, what do you think might happen next? Or how do you think we should handle this as a way to expand their language? But when they're first learning, pay attention to that you might find that you end up trying to stimulate their language by asking question after question after question. What color is this? What are, you, what are we doing? Pay attention to that and switch that around to comments more of that self-talk, parallel talk that we just talked about. So another couple things here uh, to pay attention to is to use a variety of words. And what I mean by that is we often say the same things in our homes and we uh, really limit what we're talking about if we only pay attention to just what's right in front of your child. If they're ready to hear more about what's happening outside of the room or outside of the conversation or outside the window, make sure you have an opportunity to do that. 
the example I like to give with uh, some uh, parents and children is baby play, where you take a doll and everybody will talk about hugging the doll and changing the doll and, and feeding the doll and burping the doll, but, but people don't often think about making the dog, the doll run or jump or uh, lay down or talk about the, how the doll looks and talk about what the doll can do and take the doll on a trip. Take Pretend you're in an airplane and the doll and you are flying over the zoo or the farm. Think about ways that you can use a variety of different words and describing words instead of just relying on kind of our own ball, dog, house, and short words like that. Another thing to think about is how you make connections. So people often don't think it's important or don't realize how important it is to just do some of that storytelling. So when you are out in the snow in the winter, you might think about, oh, remember that book that we read about the little boy who walked in the snow? Or if you're finding a caterpillar in your yard, you might, you might think about, oh, remember that book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar? Or do you remember that time when Grampy found the butterfly and he caught it in his hands and he showed it to you? Or I remember when I was little, we used to find fireflies and put them in a jar. Firefly lights up at night and when it was dark outside, we could see them flying around. Making connections between what you're doing now and what you might have done as a child or what you together might do as a future is another way to facilitate language development. So let's look at how you might use some of these, just kind of talking through some of those strategies. It's, I know it's really weird that it's cutting carrots. It just happened to be what I was doing when I was thinking about this presentation. So if you have a child who's not talking much and they're bored and they are kind of getting in a place where you don't want them to be, bring them up to the counter, stick them on a, a little step stool and have them sit with you while you're cutting the carrots. And maybe if they're not using a lot of language, you might just be doing cut, cut, cut as you cut the carrots. You're just modeling the language. Or you might be talking a little bit more about what you're doing. I'm cutting up the carrots. This one's really long and thin, or this one's really fat, or this one looks kind of funny. This one's green, this one's orange. Sometimes carrots come, are purple. Sometimes I, animals like to eat carrots. I like to eat carrots when they're cooked, but I don't like them raw. Or whatever it is that you think of as you're cutting the carrots. You're just, again, bringing them into the conversation and engaging them by building their receptive skills. And then they can use that to develop their expressive skills and other parts. Parallel talk, again, as I said, you, let them do some of it. Let them sort the carrots. If they, if they have a sharp knife and that's not age appropriate, don't do that. I don't want you saying, telling everyone I told you to do that. But have them find the big ones or the small ones or take off the green parts or talk about what it is that they find interesting about them. Expand whatever they say by adding one more element. And for kids who are a little bit older, talk about other things that are related to the carrots or vegetables. Talk about how things grow. Talk about what seasons they grow in. Talk about recipes that you like where there's carrots or switch the subject to other food items and expand it that way. Do a little bit of a project around what vegetables and how they grow. Plant something. Just kind of take it to another level as you start just using the the exercise of being in the kitchen together, and then making those connections about things that happened when you were younger, or reading a story that you read before, or something you saw on TV that had something to do with carrots. And this is a similar slide, and you'll have slides like this. Um, you'll have all of these slides. It's the same kind of idea with, with playing with cars or taking a walk or taking a stuffed animal or pretend uh, on a pretend adventure to the farm or the zoo. What might you taste? What might you see? What might you hear? Talking about things that you're doing every day can be as much a part of that child's language development as the, the very direct work that they're doing online with their teachers and their staff. Tim already referenced sorting laundry. That's another way to talk about colors and textures and size. Um, bathing is an opportunity to talk about body parts, splashing, things that swim, things that live in the water, all kinds of opportunities to just think a little bit outside the box. 
and it doesn't come naturally to everyone. I, I would think after all these years that I could just come up with all these words right away, but I still find myself before a session saying, okay, today we're gonna to talk about whatever activity. I have to think a little bit ahead to what other things can I introduce in this session? Uh, because it doesn't just come automatically all the time. So take five minutes to say, you know what, we're gonna talk about these five things while I get ready for dinner because these are the five ingredients in my recipe and talk about that with your child and kind of keep your comments, maybe three, and then ask a question. Um, or pay attention again to how are you using those questions? Are you using them to engage your child or are you using them to just ask what they know and balance that out a little bit more? For those of you who really wanted to hear more about speech specific, I did include a, a little slide about sound production. Um, and one of the ideas I had was, you know, just use some of the toys you're already using. One of the things we do is if we're playing with a farm set or a, a bus with young children in it, we'll name all the characters uh, with a name that begins with the target sound. So if they're working on K, they might be Katie and Kevin and Carrie on the bus. And we kind of overemphasize that a little bit while you play on the floor with the bus or look for a book that has some of those sounds that your child is working on. So you're just modeling for them those opportunities to hear that sound because children, again, just like receptive language, you need to be able to understand the language before you start using it. With sound production, you need to be able to hear that sound and how that's different from other sounds before you start producing it. So providing them with those models through book reading and activities like that is another way you can target those skills. And then I'm so glad that Marnie talked already a little bit about social stories. These are some other just general concepts. I, I hate it when parents feel like they have to have super special drawing abilities or uh, find ways to find the most complex pictures. I can't tell you enough how easy it is for children sometimes to accept a little round circle and two sticks for a body and use that little representation to walk through a social story. It doesn't have to be fancy. You can draw it by hand, but you can pick up photos online. You can use your own photos. Just, just a way to represent the concept for the child and talk through how you would like for that to turn out. And it's okay for you to say, I'm scared when this happens, this is one of the things I can do. And there's all kinds of resources for that in Marnie's previous presentation and in the uh, Google Drive that we put together for you. So in closing, I just wanna go back to that first slide when I started. How do you facilitate speech and language skills? Think about what you wanna do and how you can incur in, uh, put the language into those activities while you're already doing them. Use what you have. You don't need special toys. Play on the floor, be silly and share your passion, what interests you, what do you like to talk about? And the more excited you are about talking, the more excited your child will be about talking. I think that's it. Thank you, Laurie. Um, we You're just welcome. had somebody make a comment saying, great examples and explanation of just add one more element. I'd also like to add, it's, um, what's great is about having all these therapists provide these examples as we're getting um, a great idea of different overlap that can happen within these um, different areas of need for our children. So while you're cutting carrots, you're not just working on speech and language by talking about it. You're also working on OT and fine motor skills, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, or while going out and taking a walk and noticing the leaves, you are not necessarily just working on talking, but you can also be including some physical therapy skills into those. Yep. And so it's great opportunities for um, us to be able to provide some overlap so that you're not having to schedule an hour out of your day or half hour out of your day to specifically work on one subject matter. And by giving you these tools, you know, our hopes are that if you're parents, you can go back to your teachers and say, well, this is what we're doing. And by doing this, we're literally knocking three goals off our list of things to do today within, you know, a 20 minute period when I know that I'll have my child's attention and that will make your life easier in the long run. Yeah, um, so that's a great that? segue for Jen because we all do have overlap in the activities that we're talking about today. Thank you. Yeah, it makes life easier. So is it Jen Corbiel is up next? Okay, you still with us, Jen? 
I think we might have lost her. Did we lose her? I have. Is that her head? It says Marnie Morneau on that one. I'm, I don't know why. I'm in there. Th I'm in there twice. I have been the whole time. I don't know why. I don't know. <laughs> I think we might have. Maybe she lost her internet connection. Maybe we, can we? Yeah. Jump to the yeah. other gen. Oh wait. Okay. She back. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Jen Corbiel, can you hear us? Might be having an internet connectivity yeah. issue. Oh, there she is. Did she pop up? I don't see her. I see her name, I but her. Oh, yep. there she is. There she is. Yeah. No, but frozen. Okay. Jen, are you ready to present or do you want us to move on? She looks it's, she looks frozen to me right now. I know. Maybe we could move to the other Jen and then mm -hmm. she can figure mm -hmm. that out and then we'll jump back to her. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. oh wait. Oh, she's ready, I think. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> it completely kicked me out four times. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I got kicked out at one point during Laurie's. Yeah, so it's like everybody's accessing uh internet and it just the bandwidth just isn't there um but if you're ready we're ready for you i am okay Can you see my screen not yet okay there it goes okay great Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Still can see my screen in presentation mode? Uh, you're not quite in presentation mode. There we go. There you okay. go. Now we're good. Okay. All right. I'm so glad we practiced three times. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I did get to hear most of Lori's though, and I'm so happy to be part of this today. So thank you, Maine Parent Federation, for putting this on. Um, you know, I think what I really want to bring to you today in regards to incorporating physical therapy into daily routines is just hopefully giving you some tools to start that conversation with your team, your physical therapist specifically, on how um, they may be able to help you meet your specific child's needs and in incorporating activities into their daily routine. So I feel like the specific activities that I give you um, from a physical therapy gross motor perspective may not be the take home message that I'm hoping today. It's a little bit hard with physical therapy compared to, you know, speech. Um, but there's a lot of activities that both Tim and Lori mentioned um, that include a lot of overlap um, with both, both the disciplines. So let's get right into it. So um, when we talk about physical activity and gross motor movement, um, this may already be built into your routine already. Um, you know, physical activity is something that we need just for our health. Um, and Jen will talk a little bit later for our mental health as well as our physical health. Um, so you may have dedicated time for physical activity already in your routine and maybe that is something that you can start incorporating those IEP goals into that dedicated physical activity time that maybe you aren't, aren't doing now. Um, and not to add more, but we do know the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends 60 minutes of vigorous physical activity, which means you get sweaty and breathless um, for kids over six years old. So something to keep in mind um, when we're trying to get that exercise in, that we do need to feel that uncomfortable, breathy, and, and sweatiness. Um, but things that, that happen every day, you walk around your home, you walk in, you know, from room to room. So maybe you have your child hop, jump, skip, gallop, or walk like an animal, can be a crab, bear, dog, whatever they come up with. I often, as a physical, treating physical therapist, will learn from the child. They'll come up with some name for some new movement. And I say, yep, that's what it's going to be. Now I have a dinosaur walk in my toolbox. Thank you for teaching me that because they do teach us so much. Um, 
Other ideas, um, Lori had mentioned this as well as Tim, during mealtime, meal prep, cleaning up, squatting down to lower cupboards, helping to get you know, a small thing of sugar or whatever it, it might be, reaching overhead, getting them up on their tiptoes, help work on that calf strength, cleaning up toys. It's, you know, about setting up the environment. If the toys are on the floor and they need to pick them up, can they pick them up and put them up on a shelf that might be a little bit higher? Maybe um, not just unloading the dishwasher, but they're helping with unloading your groceries as well as setting the, the table. And as Lori mentioned, what do you need? You don't need special toys or special tools in your home to help your child and support their physical therapy or IEP goals for gross motor activity. You just need your imagination and sometimes your child's imagination. Some of the things that we'll kind of talk about are um, pillows, towel rolls, paper towel rolls, and I found some really great rolling pin activities, which I thought was really fun. Um, you know, can you make this a family affair? In maybe it's a walk after dinner, maybe it's a dance party. Um, is there a sibling that can help out in this, in this time to make it a little bit easier with carryover? In some of our sessions, we'll often use a sibling to help. Um, and we'll hear years later that they're considering becoming a therapist, which is always nice because we do need more therapists. So that's always a bonus. We've kind of talked about laundry. Tim had mentioned laundry. Lori had mentioned laundry, laundry from a language perspective. And I just kind of want to touch on safety first. Um, you know, whether your child has shoes on when they're working on their um, physical therapy or gross motor activities is something that I would touch base with your team. Um, barefoot play is amazing. You get a lot of sensory input into your feet, but it also helps to strengthen the small muscles in your feet as well. Um, if a child's jumping or, you know, really doing a lot of those animal walks and putting a lot of pressure on their feet, then it may make sense for them to have their footwear on. And of course, if they have orthotics or braces, um, that would be something you wanna kind of consult with your team. Are these activities I can do without them or should they have them on? Um, using a laundry basket, you can work on after you fold the laundry with the child, working on the fine motor skills and talked about the colors and sorting. You can step in, step out of the laundry basket, reach into it. Um, other um, activities using a towel or a paper plate, you could have them crawl around like a bear. It's really, really difficult to do this. We'll use scooters in the gym here sometimes when we're doing in-clinic visits. Um, and it's a super challenging activity. Uh, one of the rolling pin activities that I thought was really cool is if you have pillows, you can set them down on the floor, have the child get into a crawling position while they're holding the rolling pin, and they push the rolling pin along the pillows as they crawl. Uh, sometimes just getting your child to slow down in whatever movement that they're doing, you're going to see a strengthening benefit from that. So some kids move, 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 and it's all about momentum. They're not always using those muscles, those core muscles. Um, so that's something that you could even do is have them slow down their movements, have them hold their different positions and movements. And then while you have those pillows out, you can have them hold onto a toy with two hands and walk across the pillow, which can help to, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, practice their, their balance. Jumping on pot holders is something that I saw out there, but I, I think you really need to have a good environment and nice floor where the pot holder won't slip. So I was just envisioning, envisioning lots of, of slipping with this. So I would be cautious with that. I just wanna get into some specific sort of body parts, if you will, <clears throat> excuse me. When we think about core strengthening, that is something where um, we're talking about the core being your abdominal muscles, your belly muscles, your back muscles, and your hip muscles. Um, so a lot of kids you know, might have a weak core if they're getting physical therapy support services in the school setting on their IEP, and um, that impacts their ability to hold themselves up and be in that ready learning position that they need to be in for circle time and for tabletop activities. So these are just some pictures of some activities that you can do with your child to help increase their core strength. 
So again, we have this hands and knees position, which is called quadruped. And we talked about crawling over the pillows with a rolling pin. This is something that you may be able to even do when your child is doing, I mean, you can do any of these activities when they're doing academics, as long as it does, doesn't take away from their ability to focus and participate in that academic, but they can be on their hands and knees, um, you know, reading potentially, and somebody could turn the book or they could turn the book and then that would make them um, challenge their balance and engage those muscles even more. Um, those are, are great, great things to do. They can do any of these activities if they're watching a movie, if they're watching a show. Um, these are just different positions that they can do any time of the day. Supine flexion, that, that second picture, um, we often call this frozen bug or um, I think it's just frozen bug. I thought there was one more name for it. The other position that's really great is this prone, right? We talk about tummy time for infants. Well, it's not just for infants, it's really important for all of us, especially after sitting for two hours. Um, it's good to get on your belly and kind of stretch out that spine a little bit. For any children that might be using a wheelchair, um, this position can be really good for them as well. I would definitely, um, you know, make sure you talk to your teams. I don't want to make recommendations that aren't appropriate for your child specifically, but it is something to consider. It can be a really good activity. Um, in order to make the quadruped, that first picture, a little bit harder, you can use a towel or a paper plate under their hand and then have them slide it forward and back. They can go over and cross midline, which can help with some of the visual skills um, and kind of carry in over some of that crossing midline OT skills, if you will. As far as lower extremity strengthening, get my mouse back here. Um, I love picking up small toys with their toes. We do a lot of this. It really helps to strengthen the bottom of their feet, a lot of the small muscles in your, in your feet. And I also think about monkeys in a barrel, these $2 toys that you can do a bazillion things with. Um, that's something that, again, they, they could do potentially while they were doing academics, maybe while they're sitting there, they, they, especially if they need to fidget, could give them something to do. Going up and down the stairs, um, just practicing stepping up and stepping down on that first stair can be a really great activity to help with strengthening the lower extremities. Making sure that they go slowly um, when they're doing this can help just really get those muscles engaged. Um, I put a couple of uh, rolling pin activities on here because I thought they were really, really cool. Um, if you have the child lie on their back, put their feet on the end of the rolling pin and then their knees are bent and they're going to slide their, their feet out and in and it really gets the muscles on the back of your, the back of your legs. Um, it's a great strengthening exercise. This other one um, was interesting. Have the child lie on their back, hold the rolling pin up in the air with your hands, and then you take their feet, their feet are going to push on the rolling pin to make it move. And I thought that was really cool and could be kind of fun, at least for a little while. Um, and that really gets a lot of ankle motion. So if the child needs to address balance, it can really get um, a lot of, of motion in those ankles. <clears throat> so some kids will have um, half kneel to stand goals in their IEP. And so when we think about this, when you're getting up from the floor, <laughs> sorry, just chuckling with the cat visiting. Um, when you get up from the floor, um, using this half kneel position is a very efficient position. You don't bump into the child next to you when you're in circle. So these positions are great for just holding positions. And again, they can do these positions while they're drawing, um, coloring, uh, cooking, meal prep, if, they, if you can do that um, you know, safely, they're obviously not going to be able to reach the counter. But these positions can be incorporated into any activity. Um, if these are too easy for them, make sure that they're really holding and they can freeze their bodies in this position. You can have them do this on pillows, 
to help challenge their, their balance and have them practice that second position, the half kneel up right up into to standing. Other positions that can be done anytime in, um, in your routine and throughout the day is sitting with your legs out straight. That really stretches the muscles on the back of, of the thighs. And I haven't in, I don't know, 25 years met a child that doesn't have hamstring tightness or an adult, honestly. Um, so this is a great position to stretch out those um, hamstring muscles as well as, as your back. Crisscross applesauce can be a great position and also a ready to learn position here. You've got your eyes looking forward, ears listening, hands at your lap. And um, this can be a really great activity as well. Getting outside and our weather is finally starting to cooperate and warm up a little bit. Um, doing bubbles, chalk, gardening, playing with a cardboard box can be a physical activity as well. Just really trying to get that physical movement going. If you have a child that's younger or a child that is um, more involved, there's, you know, any, any um, during diaper changes, you can have them try to help by holding their leg up, hold it up and count to 10. You get math skills there, um, hold it up, count to five, whatever it might be. Or maybe they hold on to a toy while you're, you know, doing the diaper change and then they're active in that respect and working their arms. If you're transitioning your child from a wheelchair to the bed or vice versa, is there anything that they can do in order to be more active during that, that time? Can they help you shift side to side? Can they help you lean? Can they lean forward? Can they push up with their arms or push up with their legs? If there's any, anything that they can do just to be more active in that transition that you do every time, probably multiple times a day. Um, a lot of the activities that we mentioned above with reaching, uh, mentioned before with reaching, um, reaching down, reaching up, any kicking objects, kicking paper towel rolls can be really fun and you can count during that time. You can do categories, work on that language. Um, those can all be done in a chair, in a wheelchair or um, standing if they have good balance. And then we talked about prone lying, um, as well being really good um, positioning. Excuse me. So um, we kind of just in, in um, summary here, you know, based on the, the lesson that the child is working on, based on that Zoom math meeting, um, maybe you can incorporate some of these positions into that to help them. They're gonna hit a couple of goals on their IEP then if you're doing that. Marching, squatting, and all taking into that, um, counting while you're doing your, your marching and your, and your, your squatting activities. Um, all right, thanks very much. And again, I hope there's just enough little bit of insight for you all. And if there's any uh, questions after Gen M, I'll um, be happy to answer those. Thank you, Jen. I know one of the things we did, and it helps that at home, we do have a physical education teacher as daddy. So mm -hmm. that does help us here at home. But one of the things that we saw on Facebook is Sammy um, doesn't, her bike is still training rails. We have full size adult training rails on there now for her, but was putting sneakers underneath the training rails so that it became a stationary bike at home because April was not the most cooperative weather month for us. Mm -hmm. And so during a motor break, which she would be asking for for school, we set it up in front of the TV. We let her put on a Peppa Pig, which is about 30 minutes long, as long as she kept the wheels moving on the bike. And it became a stationary bike for her. And the way that that transitioned as weather improved to her getting out and actually riding her bike in the neighborhood and having much more confidence made huge steps for us and, we, and it became a phys ed goal because she has phys ed right now. It was a motor break from her, but it was also a PT goal. And so we were kind of killing three birds with one stone and then it's equated to her having much more confidence here at home. And it was something that we found on Facebook that popped up during the pandemic, which was really, really fun. Um, during April, it was so challenging to get outside and be active because it was just rainy and cold. <laughs> it, was, it was winter all over again. It was a rough <laughs> month. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to now pass the buck to our second gen. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen, and we're going to talk about taking care of ourselves now a little bit. Thanks, Carrie. And thanks for everybody was sticking with us. It's been a 
been, we've been doing this for a while. So, hey, thanks for that. Um, for those of you who know me, it's not going to come as any surprise that I'm going to go a little off script here. Um, I think what might be more meaningful is if I took the few minutes that I have to kind of join Tim and join Larry, join Tim and join Lori and join Jen. Maybe I need a little speech help here, Lori. Um, in the things that they were saying so that all of this can come together in a meaningful way for everybody. So rest assured that I will touch on all the things that are on the list that I've given you. Um, and there's lots of resources, both in this PowerPoint and in the drive that we're sharing. So um, I'm just going to do it this way and we're going to see how it goes. So I want to start off with um, reassuring everyone that all of life is learning. So no matter what you're doing at any time of day with anything, you're learning something and your kids are learning something. So as important as it is to be attentive with specific goals about things, you're going to be learning. So big deep breath about that. We're spending lots of time breathing and taking big deep breaths now. So just take a big deep breath about that. Um, and I think the things that Marnie talked about in terms of connecting the experiences you're having now with that to-do list on your IEP or IFSP is a great way to capture the fact that all of life is learning. So there's that. Um, everyone in some way or another talked about routine. And from a mental health perspective, what routine does is it creates consistency and predictability in the world. And right now that's a tough thing to come by in some ways. So the importance of creating routines that fit you, your family, your children, that are flexible to meet any of the demands and needs that you have in any given moment helps us be able to function in this part of our brain, the part of the brain that's ready for learning and problem solving and communicating, instead of this part of the brain that's just set up for survival. It's really, really hard, like next to impossible to actively learn something when you're in this part of the brain. So routines help us to be able to be available for learning in ways that are intentional and um, a little bit beyond that present moment. Um, what else did Marnie talk about? Oh, the fact that you might be doing things over again. Hey, repetition is mastery, man. Like we gotta do stuff over again. And that's actually one of the beautiful things about life is that it often gives us chances to do things over when we haven't quite learned everything that we can from the things that we're doing. So seeing that with some gratitude um, and as a blessing to have the opportunity to do something over again. Um, I, I used to own a farm and one of our mantras was any job worth doing once is worth doing twice. So um, embrace repetition as an opportunity for mastery. Um, let's see, Tim talked about routine two, um, movement. So I'll try to combine a little bit of what Tim and Jen said about movement and motion and gesture. So movement, motion, gesture, and posture is very much con connected to our mental health, well-being, and our emotional life. So gestures that are reaching gestures are expressing connection and relationship and expressing emotion and expressing a mental state. So meeting that reaching gesture with joining with that gesture and offering whatever is being reached for helps to build a sense of safety and security in the context of that relationship. So understanding that movement, motion, posture, and um, gestures are part of our emotional and mental health helps to not only build relationship, but also um, probably meet some of the SEL goals that you have in your IEPs and IFSPs 
in terms of that serve and return relationship. Um, understanding, uh, one thing that, I, that Marnie talked a little bit about, but I think she's gonna talk about more in a minute, um, is around individualizing and knowing your children. You know your children best. So interpreting their gestures and motion and movement and postures as a form of communication in terms of what they need and want and intend emotionally and psychologically is a part of building that sense of themselves and their relationship with you. So the movements and motion and gesture that is soothing and nurturing and comforting, let's do more of that. And being able to address those behaviors that are comfort seeking and nourishing now is really important in terms of kids being able to manage their anxiety. Um, Tim also talked about, um, and Lori and Jen talked about um, tailoring whatever you're doing to what kids are most interested in. I mean, that's kind of a no brainer, but I'm not sure to curse to everybody all the time, partly because we're driven to do these things and accomplish this goal. So really, again, knowing your kids and orienting what you're doing around what their interests and um, passions are around learning will be a much more successful experience for everybody and create less strain and stress on your relationship with them. Um, let's see, what else? Lori talked about the in and out of communication um, and in a, in a psychological and an emotional frame of reference, that's that serve and return. That is creating that circle of relationship between you and your child. Um, Self-talk. When you're doing self-talk, when you're externalizing self-talk, you're able to model problem solving. You're able to model emotional regulation. You're able to model putting words or communication, if it's nonverbal, obviously I'm a big nonverbal communicator. I can't talk without my hands. Um, when you're doing that kind of self-talk, you're modeling that for kids. Um, and then the parallel talk is all about noticing and being noticed. So in, in a mental health way, doing parallel talk might sound something like, wow, I can see you're really frustrated by this because you just threw the pen across the room. That's parallel talk from a mental health perspective. And then that brings you into that circle of communication around problem solving that situation and recognizing and acknowledging that emotional and psychological place. And then you could add some movement into it because, hey, we've been sitting here for almost two and a half hours and anybody's gonna be frustrated. So let's get up, do some shakes, do a child's pose, do some stretching, because all that stress and tension is held in our body. It's held in our spine, it's held in our big joints, shoulders, hips, stretching those things out, moving that around helps us not to carry that around anymore. In addition to being active and being able to move and having access to those things, it's really important to rest as well. So rest isn't the same thing as sleep and we could talk about that forever, <laughs> but um, resting, doing, being at rest, whatever that means for you and whatever that means for your child, allows us to have a sense of ease without being asleep. So balancing that activity with opportunities for rest helps to keep our mood and our energy level at a, at a relatively stable place. Now, stability right now is, um, yeah, that's, uh, we can talk about that for a long time too. Um, let's see. Household chores, doing stuff like laundry and dishes and things like that. Being helpful and a valuable member of something right now is a big part of our sense of well being. So, being helpful in ways that um, 
also match uh, your child's preferences around doing dishes or laundry or whatever it is that they would prefer to do also helps to contribute to their sense of well-being in terms of being a valuable member of your family, which means they're important in the world and they're meaning something to somebody and that meaningfulness is important. Um, let's see. Uh, and nature on being outside. So people have um, strong preferences oftentimes about preferring to be inside or preferring to be outside. And both of those things are under pressure right now. So having the opportunity to meet those preferences in terms of being outside or being inside can be helpful in terms of that regulatory piece emotionally and psychologically too. So all the things that I put in those short lists, I made it really long in that story I just told. Oh, storytelling. That was the other thing Lori said that I didn't want to miss. Um, Stories are super powerful. So um, having books around and telling stories and you can combine that um, parallel talk and self-talk in storytelling by saying things like, remember that time when we had that terrible storm and we couldn't go out for a lot of days and that was so hard. It's kind of like that right now. And it was hard, but we got through it. Or remember that time when you couldn't see your best friend because they were on, away on vacation and you were really sad and we got through it. And this is how we did that. Um, so combining all of that into a story that helps kids remember times that they were successful in doing things that were really hard for them makes, and if you're taking a walk while you're doing that, and how can we throw some fine motor in there? I don't know, but we totally could. Like you could be doing a Rubik's Cube, I don't know. But we can put all that stuff together in a general life experience of just being together on the planet during this time and tick all those boxes on the plan. So um, I think I covered everything in those short lists. Taking care of your body, being mindful, that means just noticing what it's like to be you right now and noticing what it what it's like to be your kids right now in terms of what you feel and what you think without judgment let's just notice what that is first and then let's make a decision about do we want to feel that way more or do we want to feel that way less and then approach it from that front of the brain perspective instead of that back of the brain perspective staying connected Tim, Lori, Jen talked about that all day long. Structure, we did that. Ask for help and give help when you can. Be a meaningful member of the whatever community you're in, whether that's just your family or in other groups that you're interacting with too. So I think I covered everything that I was gonna talk about and brought a bunch of stuff together for us. So I think it's Marnie's turn to wrap things up. And once again, I thank everybody for their attention and sticking with us. Thank you, Jen. We did have feedback. Somebody said these things are great to share with parents. I'll put them on my classroom parent board and I will share them in our newsletter. Um, I don't know where I learned it from, but we used the HALT method. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. HALT, halt is met before anything else. Yeah, I, I think that probably it's, it's funny, somebody put a sign on their cabinet door saying, stop, are you really hungry or are you just bored? <laughs> you know, that sort of, but I like the halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I will admit to being the, the person who wakes up in the morning with a list in my head and um, what I'm trying to learn through this process is acknowledging that I do not have to get everything on that list accomplished in order for my day to be successful and letting go of that responsibility in order for me to feel good about what I've done during the course of the day and meeting the needs of not the list in my head, but of my family at this time, which is going to take me off course from that list and being okay with that. And that's, that's one of the harder lessons, especially during, I mean, all day long, that's a lesson for me, but especially during this pandemic, it's really heightened that for me. Um, yeah. So We're while Marnie wraps up, I'm gonna I, launch. Just one oh, last thing I want to say, yeah. Carrie, you reminded me. Um, 
we're often much more kind with other people than we are ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself doing some self-talk, again, we're wrapping Lori in here. If you're doing some self-talk that isn't so kind, maybe ask yourself if you would say that same thing to your best friend. And if that's not something you'd say to your best friend, what would you say to them? And that might yeah. help you get out of that space of criticism and judgment and allow you to do the thing that's the most reasonable thing to do. So very good point. Take care like of you that because you're a cool person. <laughs> Thank you so much. A um, ton of information in this webinar. I appreciate all of your time. I did launch our poll. Um, and if um, our participants could take a few minutes while we wait for further questions to come in or while Marnie wraps up, just to fill out that poll, that's really, really yeah. helpful, especially for Maine Parent for Federation and for the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies as we are both federally funded and have lovely federal reports we have to fill out and your <laughs> feedback goes a long way to us receiving that funding and keeping these programming programs free for you. So please, if you would take a moment. Um, and fill yep. that out while Marnie um, put some final thoughts together for us. That would be great. I don't have any questions in queue at this point in time. Perfect. Great. Got our last bit up there. Okay, so to wrap it up, so you've heard lots and lots of information about how to add these activities as part of your day. Um, but how do you share what your child has learned? So you've been together for a while now with your kiddos and you'll continue to be as you wrap up whatever it means for school year and through the summer. Um, sharing what your kiddos has done is really important and there are several ideas for how you can do this. Um, you are the experts on your kids. So save that tracking that you're doing to share your progress and your difficulties use whatever documentation form is the easiest for you. And I really always encourage parents not to discount the value of pictures and videos um, as a great way to document successes and challenges. And to give everybody just a couple of samples, um, I would have, let's see, I pared it down, two that are really great that I love. Um, one is this one, let's see if it's gonna take us out and work. Right here, okay. This one comes from Children's Specialized Hospital. Pulls in the way for me. Okay, so if you scroll down to the second page, and this is in the drive for you all, it's a printable form. Um, and this is the populated one, so you can see a sample, that's always helpful for me. And it shows uh, three sample goals and just simply little smiley faces of what you worked on with your kiddo at home. It's laid out in a week format, and what you can see is the third page in here um, is blank for you, so you can print it off. Um, when I dumped it into Google Drive, it let me work on it, so that was very helpful. If you're like me, I can type faster than I can write at this point in life. So this is a simple one if you want to use this one. Um, so you can as we've been talking about today, doing the laundry, going for a walk, whatever activities you want to list for that goal, um, you can just add in there and indicate if it worked for you. Um, you could put little notes about whatever, if it was a challenge, a success, anything that you tried that worked really well. So that's one sample. Hi, Sammy. Oh, Sammy sees somebody she knows. <laughs> that's exciting. And then let's go back. So that's one example. And then in that um, wide open school resource that we looked at earlier, they also have a daily planner recording sheet. And we saw that briefly. So also really simple. Morning, midday, afternoon, evening. So the intent is really for it to not be cumbersome for you, something that you can print off, jot a few notes, whatever structure works best for you. Again, when I dumped this into Google um, Drive, it turned it into a word, uh, into a doc, and I was able to type in that. So simple for you. And then um, just so you know, we have lots more information for you in our living drive. So um, it's a Google Drive. We'll keep adding resources as we find them. So I would check back periodically. So here's our drive. 
you'll have it access to this. And I think, in fact, Carrie's already put a link to that for you. I posted it in the chat box, but we'll also put it up on our website um, yeah. as well. And yep. um, we'll put it up um, on our website right next to the recorded webinar. Um, right. It does take us a couple of days to get that up. Um, right. So you'll be able to access the recording on Facebook, but um, for the Google Drive and uh, the recording on YouTube, it takes us a couple of days. So it might be Monday of next week before that's up. But right. I did post our webpage as well um, as right. where you can find that materials. So wonderful. So just to give you a quick um, sort of teaser about what's in there, there's some specific ones for teachers. Um, there's resources for families that are specific to disability routines, structures, apps, speech and language, social stories, note taking. We've got a lot of things. If there's things that you don't see that you would find helpful, um, if you let us know, um, as I said in the beginning, I'm, I'll put my email in that resource list and I'll give it to Carrie to have. Just let us know and we'll be glad to um, respond. That's one of our roles at CCIDS. If you need resource, we can do that for you. So go ahead and um, let us know. We'll be glad to do that. We're getting lots of thank yous. The panel um, was um, great. Um, awesome job okay. presenter team. Um, we will give out um, certificates. I've put Deb Epperson's name in the chat box or email address. Um, if you can email her for a request for a certificate, we're emailing out certificates so you can get them as soon as possible. Um, thank you, Tim, for the separation of age group examples for OT suggestions, great ideas, and great job everyone working off each other's suggestions and putting examples together. This helped me develop and, and think about my child's goals. Love the interdisciplinary input, very practical and relevant, thank you. Um, the document that you just put up, um, Marnie, this document will be very helpful. Thank you. Um, so much helpful information to allow me to pass on to my families I work with. So um, I, I think no specific questions, but I want to thank all of you for the time and effort you put into this webinar. Bringing five professionals of this level together is not an easy thing to do, especially right now. Um, so I really appreciate you guys collaborating um, and working together for our families. Um, the information was so helpful, even for myself, um, in practicing different pointers here at home as we work towards the end of homeschooling. <laughs> We're almost there. We are almost there, Carrie. We're almost uh, there. Yeah, I'm counting down the days to June 5th on my calendar. <laughs> and I'd love to be able to walk back into Jen Corbiel's offices as opposed to uh, teletherapy. Um, but I really appreciate the time and effort you all put together. It was all so useful for our family. So thank you so much. Um, and Marty and I are going to look to collaborate again as we yeah. look to put transition plans in place for schools. So yeah. keep your eyes peeled on our website for um, another upcoming webinar with Marty sure. um, to pull some team members together on good practices for transitioning back to school. Yep. So, that will be in process at some point. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank and you. with that, I don't see any other questions. So we'll end the webinar for the day. And everybody be well and get outside and enjoy some of the sunshine. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. thank you. Thanks, team. Take care. Nice job. Thank you so much.